Coming up next, we'll explore a couple of unique buildings in downtown Springfield, then we'll head over to Decatur and look at a couple of their historic buildings. I'm Dave Leonati. That's next on Building Stories. This program is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Leonati, host of Building Stories. And as usual, I am joined by Anthony Rubano of the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. We're going to take another tour, and uh, right now we're in downtown Springfield. And it's funny, Anthony, we've t done a lot of these shows, and uh, it seems like we've started in front of this building many times. So we thought we'd uh, go into and visit the, uh, the old uh, state capitol in downtown Springfield. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, in the walking tours that I volunteer to do for downtown Springfield Incorporated, we also start here on the plaza. Uh, it makes a good starting point for a, a lot of the routes that we take around the downtown. It's so centered, it really is the heart of the downtown. Uh, yet, as you say, we, in, for this program, never really have looked <laughs> at this building. Right. We've always so started here. We've always started here. It is a wonderful building, and it's so important for many different reasons. Certainly, historically, it's a significant building. Many important things occurred in this building associated with Abraham Lincoln, but then also it was the state capital of Illinois and also a county courthouse for, for many, many years. Um, so this does have a lot of uh, uh, historic significance to it, but it also has architectural significance. This building that was completed in the very late, or, well, 1839, 1840, around there, is, is a really significant example of the Greek Revival. The Greek Revival was a style that was um, very popular in this country in the early 19th century, from about 1810 through 1840, 1850, something like that. Mm -hmm. It was a style that was imported from Europe, as so many styles were at that time. And the Greek Revival was a style that literally revived the architecture of the Greeks. It's, you know, pretty obvious when you look at the name of it. So when we look at the building, what we're looking at is the architecture of the Greeks, namely their, their temples, like the Parthenon, um, uh, revived in the styles that were, uh, or in the materials that were available in the early 19th century in America. So when we look at this building, we see this four-columned portico, which is the, the um, group of four freestanding columns with that triangular thing on the top that we call a pediment. That whole shape there is a portico, and that looks like the front of a temple, like the Parthenon. And so this image of a columned front with a pediment on the top is something that happens over and over again in the Greek Revival style. It's a very obvious way to recall the architecture of the Greeks. And when we talk about Greek Revival, it really mostly is their temple architecture that was being revived in the early 19th century. Right. So when we look at the old state capitol, we have, and it's, it's, an, it's a very symmetrical building. The south side is the same as the north side. The east side is the same as the west side. So we have these two wonderful entrance porticos here on the north and south sides. They look like the Parthenon itself, stuck to the sides of this longer building that goes east to west. That is another Parthenon, sort of. Right. Um, the columns are now flat against the walls in the main body of the building, but the columns with the recessed walls in between still recall the temple architecture of the Parthenon and many other wonderful Greek temples. It's raised up on a, on a, on a sort of half basement, we call it sort of an English basement, so there are steps to it. Raising it up off the ground is something that elevates the building literally, but it also gives it an importance. Right, right. Whenever you walk up to something, the implication More is... More claiming of its site than, exactly. than being down below. And, exactly. and the building is then up looking down at you, and so it gives the building a more a impressive presence on the site as well. So we have then the, the building itself that is surrounded in columns, or in this case, piers, much like, much like a Greek temple. So the Greek revival was something that really was looking at actual Greek buildings to get the proportion, the sense of design correct, so that when people would build these buildings in the early 19th century, the, the association was immediate. You saw this, you understood that this was the ancient Greeks, their philosophies, their truths that, that we were claiming when we build in, in this manner. Mm -hmm. So this kind of architecture was very important for state capitals as they began to be built in the early 19th century. Ohio has a very important Greek Revival state capital. 
This one in Illinois, this one designed by John Rague, who was a local builder craftsman here in Springfield, but based on pattern books that were created in the east, in the east coast of this country, and then brought westward. And so this building looks similar to that which those which appeared in those pattern books. So this dome is an important sy symbol to the exterior of the building, so. but you don't get a sense of it from the inside, ah, okay. unlike the new state capitol. Okay. But I'm sure that the drum, which is what we would call the thing underneath the dome, it's, it's literally called a drum. The drum does allow the windows to admit light into so, the interior through okay. that oculus in the floor. And so it does bring light into the inside, but we don't get that sense of being under this, you know, the dome of the heavens, if you will, right. which is so much of what dome sort of represented uh, when we're standing in the building. Okay. All right. So I guess we'll uh, talk about the exterior where it uh, claims this site and prominently in downtown. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can go in. I think so. And have a look at that. All right. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Okay. We're coming in to uh, up the main. Uh, Plaza walkway towards uh, one of the entry porticos here, uh, Anthony. So we can talk. I guess we'll talk a little bit about. You talked about the original date of the building, mm -hmm. 1830s, mm -hmm. 1840s, mm -hmm. correct? But there was a huge project for the time uh, as part of. Uh, I don't even call it urban redevelopment in downtown Springfield, mm -hmm. but the complete reconstruction. Yes, the complete the reconstruction capital. of the building. Right. Uh, the building itself remained the state capital into the 1870s, 80s when the state government moved out into the new state capital. Then it became the Sangamon County Courthouse and it remained the courthouse for decades. In the early 20th century the building actually was lifted up and a full first floor was inserted underneath the older building. Uh, the county government moved out into their new facilities on uh, more to the uh, west of, of where we're standing, I'm sorry, the east, east of where we're right. standing right now. And so in time for the centenary of the state, the building, there were plans developed to restore the building to the way that it looked in the early 19th century when okay. Lincoln would have known it in the 40s and 50s. And so the decision was made because of all of the alterations that the building had undergone through the county government's in you know uh, mm -hmm. time and so forth, the decision was made to dismantle the building, remove mm -hmm. the interior, and then re reconstruct the building using the exterior stone entirely, mm -hmm. um, getting rid of the first floor that was added in the early 20th century, mm -hmm. putting back the more appropriate Roman silhouette dome that we talked about already on the top of the building, and then bringing the interiors back to the way that they would have looked or we think they would have looked during the time when Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln would have been in the building in the 40s and 50s and, and uh, so on. So this major project was begun in the, in the middle 1960s, done by the firm of Ferry and Henderson, finished by 18, I'm sorry, 1968. <laughs> and so the building has just enjoyed its 40th anniversary as right. this newly reborn historic site. And it really took a lot of, of people coming together and understanding yes. all of the, the, the forces at work here and indeed to put a parking garage under the plaza yeah. where we're standing now. Very, very beneficial to downtown. Beneficial as, as a downtown an amenity. person. I park there. Exactly. I do too. Very, very, very beneficial. So and that, that project allowed uh, a headquarters for the State Historical Library, which was underneath the building when mm -hmm. it was finished in 1968. That's so the project of, of taking it apart and putting it back then allowed not only parking garage, but also additional administrative space and museum space in effect. And so this was part of this larger um, idea of infrastructure and benefit to to the entire city and beyond because of the significance of the, of the, of building. the building. Sure. But again, I think the significance does uh, part of the significance does lay in that preservation um, project uh, that really was not terribly common in the no, 1960s it was not. at all. It was not. There be there uh, to be lauded for that making that effort at that time. Absolutely. But while we're here also um, and we're on the south coming from the South Plaza. We're going to take a little stroll here because one of Anthony and I were talking about there's another building we want to look mm -hmm. at, which Absolutely. is called the Reich building. The, the Reich building, which is on the uh, on Fifth Street on the west side mm -hmm. of the downtown uh, Old State Capitol Plaza. So, we want to, well, we're looking at the Reich building, which we think is probably uh, early 19 or 19, 19th century, 1900s, mm -hmm. 1910 or mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Anthony, and, and one of the things you notice is uh, its height compared to. Uh, relatively to the other buildings, and also its ornament. The ornament is very, is, is yeah. very unusual, true. Yeah. Um, after the death of Queen Victoria in the early 20th century, Edward ascended to the throne, and generally speaking, there was a lightness that came to architecture in England, uh, uh, more uh, 
elegant proportions, lighter colors, pastels, and, and just an overall sense of delicacy that, that came to ornament, especially in interiors uh, in, in the early 20th century. And in America, there was a similar, because we always would look to England for certain sure. cues, there was a similar lightness that came to, to certain strains of architecture. So we look at the Reich building here, and we see things that look classical or that are derived from certain classical elements. For instance, the limestone columns between the, the pairs of windows mm -hmm. on the facade. Very unusual. They almost look like, like scales, something mm -hmm. from a reptile. Mm -hmm. Actually, those are laurel leaves. Uh, which are typical Roman elements, just a, a V-shaped laurel leaf. And on these columns, they're just replicated one on top of another, and they look like scales. So the leaf is Roman. The idea of bun bundling reeds around the bottom of the column right. uh, is Roman. But the way that they're all put together is not something that's terribly correct, if mm -hmm. we could use that word. So again, architects are doing things that are a little less academic, a little more imaginative, still classical, but not directly so. The, the top cornice. of the building yeah, the is just is outrageously great. It is, it is outrageous, you're right. It's yeah. just this explosion of very interesting and unusual things. We look at underneath the top floor windows, there's this bracketed cornice that goes across, these circular discs mm -hmm. that might look like metopes in a, uh, a Doric entablature are abstracted just to plain cir circles of limestone there on that, on that horizontal uh, sill. Underneath the end windows, there are these panels with little uh, uh, tassels that drop down, mm -hmm. and they're abstracted right. in limestone, but they're abstracted into something completely different. So we see a basis in classical language, but again, changed and altered because there was this mannerism that was, that was uh, uh, becoming fashionable. It didn't sweep the country, but there are many examples of it from that early 20th century, 1910, to immediate, immediately before the First World War, and this building fits right in there. Well, this is, you know, the Reich building is, uh, as Nathan and I are talking, a little bit different than other buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, eclectic and eccentric, a lot of interesting ornament, uh, a good uh, addition to the mix of architecture in downtown Springfield. Mm -hmm. And in a little bit, we're going to go uh, look at a couple more buildings here in downtown Springfield. But right now, we also spent some time in Decatur, so we're going to look at a couple of historic buildings that Anthony and I found there. Tony and I are walking uh, east on uh, North Park Street. We're catty corner from the Transfer House, which is sort of a landmark in the central square of downtown Decatur. And we're going to look at the United States Post Office, which is a beautiful, uh, and I don't know, Tony, if this is attributable to like WPA. It's the same era. Yes, it is. Um, although I don't know if this, this one is, is a, specifically a WPA uh, but same, post office. Same era. It's, it's that era. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was designed in 1934 uh, by uh, a local firm, Brooks, Bramhall, and Daig. Mm -hmm. And it really is a spectacular building. And it, it also is very typical of the kinds of post offices and federal buildings that the WPA, a federal program, mm -hmm. did fund in the, uh, in the 1930s as part of the New Deal, so from 1933 onward. Um, this certainly was a, a federally funded project, mm -hmm. and so um, it was designed in more of a, a federal style, or it had, mm -hmm. at least in mind, more of a governmental or civic presence. The architecture that it, that it uses is one that the federal government used often in the 1930s. It's a kind of architecture that combines elements of classicism, which is uh, looking at Greek and Roman architecture, along with elements of art deco or art moderne, so more jazzy, streamlined, abstracted mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. And those two modes are combined into this kind of architecture that's collectively called today streamlined classicism. Mm -hmm. So the words streamlined classicism are pretty clear as to what's, what's going sure. on here. This thing is very, very sharp, very clean, mm -hmm. but still you have the, the, the giant order of the column, you know, the exactly. pilasters and columns. And Springfield has a great example of this in the armory in right. downtown Springfield, but very this similar. one is perhaps a more overt use of the kind of architecture that mm -hmm. uh, is more generally used and considered as streamlined classicism. This building uses a lot of elements from both uh, modes of, of uh, architecture. For instance, the columns, as you're saying, between the windows mm -hmm. clearly are abstracted classical, classical. columns. Right. There's fluting on them, which is the mm -hmm. vertical shafts carved mm -hmm. into the stone. 
at the tops of them. Instead of a large Corinthian capital, we have a very abstracted, almost art deco flowering bouquet up there. Right. Clearly, it's, it's intended to be read as a column with then the spaces between being the windows themselves. Mm -hmm. The windows are vertically oriented. The spandrels, which is the space between the windows, are dark. I think they're of cast aluminum. That's what and they so look to they be. recede as the columns come forward. Right. So we get this intense rhythm along the front, which is a very strong, assertive kind of organization. It's a, it's a very powerful composition. The end bays are where the entrances are. This building is perfectly symmetrical, and those are full uh, flowers of this cast aluminum um, uh, metalwork, both in windows and in spandrels, the door surrounds as well. If we look at the spandrels of the windows, they alternate in modes of transportation. They're very beautiful in, in their symbolism and in their degree exactly. of... Exactly. Uh, the of, circles uh, are wheels right. or compass points, but then we have a locomotive, an airplane symbolizing, obviously, airmail, and then ship, the, 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 the main, main ways that transportation, that transportation the would, would uh, circulate the mail. Mm -hmm. On either side of the front door, we're looking at these little circular motifs mm -hmm. that really uh, look to me like a globe with lines of latitude drawn onto mm -hmm. them. So again, another indication of the worldwide reach of the United States Postal Service. Right. The decoration around the door, again, is a combination of Art Deco motifs as well as classicism. And the doors themselves are framed with these just wonderful stanchions, these light poles um, out of what looked like aluminum. They announce the entrance, they illuminate the front, but they also themselves are, are phallic statements mm -hmm. almost that yeah. really um, communicate the kind of power that the federal government wanted to embody they're, they're in like architecture like this. They're almost like a giant, like a giant order lantern of sorts. They're exactly. really huge. They're, they're outscaled. The other thing I noticed standing here also at the very top over each entrance in carved relief up high, you have what appears to be the Pony Express. Yes. Also, another earlier method of... Mm -hmm. The seal of the, the Postal mail. Service, right. one assumes. Mm -hmm. If you go inside the building, the, the public lobbies are lavished with marble, and perhaps most impressively, I mean, the lobby is as wide as the building, so this right. is a tremendous public space in there, but it is fully decorated with more cast metal grills and ornament. The, the original writing fantastic. stands are there. Right. And the perhaps murals. most importantly are those murals right. done at more, most likely as a part of the New Deal which uh, involved the creation of art, both uh, painting and murals as well mm -hmm. as music and playwriting. Really this, exactly. this funded all sorts of, of art endeavors. And so these murals were commissioned by the federal government from artists and they were almost always allegorical in nature as this one is depicting Abraham Lincoln and, and other uh, scenes of yeah, history, local history. We see Frank Lloyd Wright's in there, Carl Sandburg in mm -hmm. there. The thing that Anthony and I are here, the exterior spandrel panels and the windows and that interior lobby work, it appears to all be original and intact. It Absolutely. Is, it, it is immaculate. It's the beautiful. integrity, the stewardship, the windows are original. It's really a tremendous building that has survived remarkably intact. And the murals also are in excellent condition. I wouldn't be surprised if they've been restored mm -hmm. uh, because the Postal Service is doing that with many of its right. uh, WPA murals, which is a wonderful thing because yeah. these murals have been uh, uh, getting grimier as years pass. Sure. And so we can see them now in their full vibrancy and really appreciate them as the works of art that they were they were meant to be. As we were standing in line, we're supposed to look up and learn about Your our shared history. heritage yep. here. Right. And just looking at the building, we can learn not only about architecture and uh, postal service, but the kinds of local history that the mural depicts. It's really a, a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful building. Anthony and I are at the uh, head end of uh, State Street. We're sort of on the south end of downtown here in Decatur, and we've come to a rather large and imposing building, the Macon County Building, Tony. This is a, a, a wonderfully imposing structure. It does anchor the south end of the downtown with its civic presence, the way that it's designed, symmetrical about this center axis that lines up with State Street. Mm -hmm. So it really is an imposing structure. Broad, wide, it sits on this crown as it does. It good, really sort of anchors that good spot. Good terminology, how this crowns the landscape, sort of a half, uh, half story out mm -hmm. of the ground, mm -hmm. which again, gives it a lot of uh, a lot of more presence, a lot of more verticality. Absolutely, the and these two rises of steps also mm -hmm. increase the, the, the sense of scale, the sense of arrival, the mm -hmm. ceremonial access to the building. The, uh, the, the building itself 
has a, a taller second floor, as we can see. It has the first floor is raised up. Mm -hmm. The second floor is obviously double height. Mm -hmm. That's where the courtrooms are for the building. So it communicates its function to a certain extent to us as we look at the front of the building. The building itself is mostly out of limestone. It's the same material as the post office that, that we've seen. Here, though, the spandrels appear to be out of glazed terracotta, whereas in the other building they were out of cast metal. Mm -hmm. Here, the terracotta glazed in a sort of patina copper color do, does give the building a, a, a certain um, um, color scheme to it. The, the clock at the top is made out of copper, so it was clearly meant to, to coordinate with, with both of those. The building is also uh, a, a somewhat of a federal building in that it was funded uh, federally. The money, it was built in 1939, the money came from not the, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, but from the PWA, the Public, Public Works, Works Administration. administration. Okay. And it was a sort the, the New Deal was a, an, an alphabet soup, really, of, <laughs> of, of, programs. of programs and agencies that worked together to fund a number of different projects. The CCC, the Civilian Conservation mm -hmm. Corps, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was in charge of watersheds south of us in the Tennessee area, damming it up for hydroelectric power. The PWA, the WPA, all of these projects, they were make work projects, make work programs to get money to make infrastructure improvements, to fund civic buildings. Uh, in, throughout the 1930s, it actually ended uh, in 1942, I believe, this entire New Deal make work program. This is a county courthouse that received federal funding and there are a number of counties in Illinois that that similarly received funding for courthouses. Okay. Princeton has one, Mount Vernon has one, Macon County obviously and there are others. So not only did the federal government fund new post office, post office and federal courthouse construction in the 1930s in our communities throughout the state, it was also funding courthouse buildings to make government work, to make it work better, to um, remind the community that the federal government was, was there, there, was still working, there was money flowing, and that also the local communities were benefiting in spite it. of the depression, in spite of these um, horrible economic conditions. And right. so this building not only was a relief to make government work better locally, it was also a symbol that there was progress happening, that the depression was coming to an right. end. It, it still gives us pause, it still communicates the power of local government here in Macon County. And this building is 1939. Okay, so it's at the very end of some, some of those same large programs. Exactly. And architecturally, it does have a resonance with the post office that we saw yes, earlier. There's some of the same cues here. This is perhaps less overtly uh, streamlined classicism, but it still fits within that vein. It's very it's very clean. Less mm -hmm. ornament here. Absolutely. Light fixtures, uh, some of the glass work over the entry. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we talked about the spandrel panels and the clock, but very clean. Very solid, very civic, again, the exactly. civic monumentality yes. to let you know that the government was firm in its commitment. Absolutely. If, if a slightly less elegant building than the post office, it right. perhaps is slightly more powerful in the assertiveness so, of its composition. Okay, we're back in Springfield, and we're at 5th and Washington on the in, uh, northeast corner of the old state capitol. And we're going to look at uh, a pair of buildings, but right now, Anthony, we're here at the uh, Stuart Broadwell building. Yeah, this is a, a wonderful building from the early 20th century, 1910, 1912, right around there. And it's an excellent example of, of the way that classics, classicism evolved uh, that was different from the Reich building. A little earlier, we talked right. about the Reich building being this sort of mannered, attenuated version of classicism. This is what a different branch of classicism looked like a branch of classicism that reduced and reduced the amount of overt ornament that were on buildings. And very so clean. what we're left with is a very clean building, mm -hmm. uh, clean of ornament, we right, should say. Yes, yes. But still with great proportions. With the proportions so really are what link it to the classical vocabulary. But we also see at the top of the building underneath this wonderful cornice is an Egan dart molding that goes across right. the building, also a very classical cool. motif. Also this, the clock that's on the uh, south side of the building uh, covered in classical ornament as well, very sculptural. Right. Very, and so very, very the building is clearly in the classical idiom, but not as overtly decorative with um, fully round columns and capitals and so on and so forth that we see in other classical buildings. It, its original function was as a pharmacy, a drugstore. The interior is completely intact, which is beautiful. It's now Upcon Look Salon, but it's 
It's uh, all there with its glass and mirrored mm -hmm. cases with rich, Beautiful. rich hardwoods. It is fantastic. And this was a, uh, a pharmacy, so the white glazed terracotta was, was a perfect choice. It was seen as hygienic and clean, right. very pure. The idea of a washable surface. So we see a lot of pharmacies at that time selecting white as the finished material just so that it gives that sense of purity and cleanliness to the entire establishment. But it's a beautiful building sitting on this corner of the, build, of the, of the Old State Capitol Square but book matched very well by another building on the other side of the square that I'd like to look okay. at next. We're going to go look at that. Great. The reason I wanted to come over to the northeast corner of the square was to take a look at the Carasotis building. Now this building is slightly newer than, than the Broadwells building by okay. maybe 10 years. This is 1925, 26, something mm -hmm. like that. But it makes such a good companion to the Carasotis building. The material is the same. It's glazed terracotta. Mm -hmm. Uh, the palette is also almost the same. This is uh, off-white glazed terracotta, mm -hmm. but the style is very similar. Mm -hmm. This stripped-down classicism. Classical. Mm -hmm. This building here, uh, same scale as the Broadwells building, has uh, no overt columns with Corinthian capitals and so forth right. as other classical buildings of, of that period did, mm -hmm. but it does have very classical elements to it. Garlands and swags, roundels going on above the storefront level, and then of course the um, the, the most obvious ornament on the building in the spandrels of the second and third floors Four. and on the cornice. Mm -hmm. The shields and with then these drapery swags coming mm -hmm. from them. Beautiful Renaissance and Baroque motifs in glazed terracotta. The um, uh, moldings on the building at the top and around the windows with their, with their ears that come down on the sides there. Um, very, very classical, very typical of the classical vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But again, no columns, no porticos or, right. or, or pediments, things like that. So this kind of stripped down classicism with the proportions of classicism and the element of classicism was very popular in the 19-teens, 1920s. And it ended as the Depression began. Uh, and, and so we see these buildings across the Midwest, across the country, really, on Main Streets. These are typical um, Main Street buildings meaning that they weren't necessarily high style examples of architecture, but they, there was a lot of these going on at the time, uh, very beautifully done, very they're, high quality execution and finish as They're well. all very, it's interesting, uh, Anthony, that this one, the Broadwell, we were talking also off camera, there are two or three other buildings that have the terracotta, mm -hmm. glazed mm -hmm. terracotta. They're very clean and in very good condition. Exactly. They're very durable ma material. Very durable. Plus, this has a little more ornament than uh, than Broadway. Than Broadway, just it a does. little bit. Yeah. And you say clean. They did clean the building a couple of years ago. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. Using just a, a bristle brush, brush and, and some detergent. Soap and water, it's, right? You know, the, the finish on the on the material, it's glazed clay, and so it's like it's, a set of dishes, really. Right. You just sort of brush it off very gently, and the dirt comes off. And so it remains this gleaming example of that style from it's a very the early pretty century. Very pretty. So uh, we're going to wrap it up here from uh, downtown Springfield. For Anthony Rubano, I'm Dave Leonati. Thank you for joining us here on Building Stories. Walking tour information available online at downtownspringfield.org. For comments or questions, email us at buildingstories at wsec.tv. This program is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a copy of the program you've just seen, send $19.95 for VHS or $24.95 for DVD to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and the date the program aired. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.